it's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much to Mark for the invitation, also Yorinda, Yort, everyone for organizing. Um, so as Mark said, I'm a historian of performance, I'm a cultural theorist, I'm a choreographer, um, and in the broadest sense, if I try to put all those things together, what my work does is to articulate how information is stored and transmitted in and through bodies in performance. Um, and so that's what ties together things like my first book on archives of watching in early 20th century Germany um, to some of the work I'm talking about today, which has to deal with the intersection of histories of performance with quantification. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking about breath as a kind of limit case for touch. Um, so I'll begin with the extremely intimate and physical connection that breath builds between body and environment. Um, before turning to my primary focus, which is making breath palpable in terms of collecting the sensory experiences of breath and sharing them with others. Um, and in the context of this extraordinary gathering on touch, I'm really interested in that slippage between the dual meanings of palpability. So on the one hand, that which is perceptible, and on the other, that which is tangible. And maybe just as a foreground, it's not an apology, but something simply to say is that I'm experimenting with putting together some things I've been working on in very different contexts, and so I'm hoping we can also talk about how they fit. Uh, so in the first part of this talk, I'm going to introduce the multidimensional nature of breath, and specifically the way breath both represents the body at its most permeable, at the same time as it poses a challenge to that idea of sharing experience with others. In the second section, I turn to the indexing of breath as data, um, and the place that performance can play in teasing out that fraught relationship between biodata and physical experience. Um, whereas the first half of the talk really pulls on more of my work as a theorist, as a historian, um, the second half uh, returns to these same ideas of breath technology and performance through creative inquiries, artistic practice. Um, so I'll discuss my breath catalog project that collects and shares breath experiences using experimental dance and tech to create what we call a cabinet of breath curiosities in performance. And just to clarify, as Mark said, uh, I know the description says there will be breathing, but uh, we ended up seeing with the size of the group and so on, we ended up deciding that it would be better if I stick to a more formal lecture structure right now. And then if you come back at 1.30, entirely optional, we have a chance to breathe together. If your way of breathing is to take a longer lunch, do that for yourself, self-care. Um, so, when I think about breath and touch, this, the word that comes to mind is permeable. So breathing is flexible. It's the only major bodily function that's managed unconsciously in a manner that can be overruled by conscious breath control. And in neuroimaging, these voluntary and involuntary aspects manifest as activity in different parts of the brain. Breath also consists of both the intercorporeal and intracorporeal circulation of air. So you have external respiration in which gases are transferred between the respiratory organs and the outer environment, and then internal respiration that occurs at a cellular level. So in this sense, breath represents the body at its most permeable. A gas saturated with water that can undergo state changes, breath has a robust and sometimes visible life outside the body as force, heat, and moisture. And here you might think of those like cartoon-like clouds that form outside your mouth in the cold. Right? But it also goes the other way too, not just inside out, but outside in. So I wrote the first draft of an essay related to this part of the talk during the Northern California wildfires earlier this year. And in the time it took me for, to alternate grieving for the thick air outside and putting words on paper, 210,000 acres of people's homes burned. And I could feel the particulate matter of people's lives in my chest with each breath. So a text from early Greek medicine addresses this permeability when it identifies wind as a key form of sustenance, but clarifies that, and I wrote this down because I love this, wind in bodies is called breath. Outside bodies, it's called air. So this passage has recently returned amid new materialist arguments where it highlights the inextricability of self and environment and the vulnerability of the body in the Anthropocene. 
However, this fluid relationship also positions breath and air in relation to the flow and float of thought. And here I'm thinking in particular about Stephen Connor on the historical role of air as a mutable mediator between thought and the world, or a rigorized suggestion that a turning to breathing and with it air might counter the insistence on logos or the ground alone. Beyond physically leaving my body and entering yours, Patterns of breath can also be used intersubjectively to tune individual proprioception toward and ultimately connect multiple bodies. And this is something I'm very familiar from in dance. Right? This connection to others is further reinforced by the relationship of breath to sound and voice. And there's a recent study, Black Pentecostal Breath, where Sean Crawley explains how breath provides the base for the whooping, shouting, and speaking in tongues that ultimately mobilizes affect among the community. So hearing breath is associated with illness and wellness, and the relationship between sound and breath is further connected to mortality and breathability as determining who has the capacity to be in relation to others in the world. From the infamous death rattle to Eric Garner's repeated words, I can't breathe, that call out the stifling conditions of structural racism. As these examples already start to suggest, Breath can call forth or be called forth by various feeling states that are relational as well, including fear, anxiety, mindfulness, surprise, and pleasure. Studies describe cycles between feelings such as panic or arousal and hyperventilation, which then produces further escalation of the feelings and so on. Um, so a recent study, in fact, points to, quote, a developing view of panic as a consequence, not the cause of respiratory reaction. So I've been arguing here for the permeability of breath in terms of how it offers extreme physical and felt connections between body and environment, self and other. However, the same multidimensional nature of breath also makes the task of sharing these experiences with others challenging. So for the past few years, I've been part of this uh, research project called The Life of Breath that's led by philosopher Javi Carell and medical anthropologist Jane McNaughton. So Life of Breath aims to develop new interdisciplinary methodologies to better account for breathing and breathlessness. And projects like these are important because discrepancies often arise between various means of articulating breath experience. Right? So as Carell explains, quote, a well-known enigma in respiratory medicine is the discrepancy between objective lung function as measured by lung function tests and subjective feeling and form. So in other words, lived experiences of breathlessness tend not to correlate to the ways in which lung capacity is descriptively understood by standard forms of pulmonary function and respiratory testing. As a result, McNaughton and Carell argue that understanding the full pathophysiology of breathlessness requires finding new methods in the critical medical humanities in order to bridge the epistemic gap between clinical knowledge and the interlinked knowledges of cultural and personal experience. And of course, you know, my tick, I'm interested in what performance can do here. So in thinking about those two meanings of palpable, so the tactile and the perceptible, I've started with how breath makes the body permeable to the world at the same time as it's challenging to make that embodied experience perceptible to others. So now I want to follow on that line of sharing sensory knowledge to think further about how such a breath body might be productive to teasing out the relation between biodata and physical experience. So tracing a hundred year history of self-tracking devices, Crawford, Lingo, and Carpi argue that the overstated celebration of precision around such devices can be dangerous. For example, as data associated with the quantified self are now being used as evidence in court cases against the wearer. Instead, they posit that more attention needs to be paid to, their, in their words, the transition from feelings to numbers, a problem that's particularly acute in Brett's uncertain archives, as I've already argued. So I posit the performance might serve as a laboratory for this transition from feelings to numbers, and especially how it might be done differently. Um, and this set of ideas is something that I've been uh, teasing out most recently some, through some research that links two stages of ubiquitous computing in relation to breath data. So specifically, um, the second generation of performance in media practices that were working with sensor data in the late 90s and early 2000s 
Uh, and I've been linking that, even though it's historically off, I think it's useful, um, to the, the wearable of the late, uh, late 2000s and now the 2010s that allows consumers to quantify their day-to-day -day lives using biometrics. Um, and I'm not actually going to talk about that research, but I'm going to pull some ideas from it out as a way to set up the creative inquiry. So at this moment in which so much conceptual power is placed in ideas from process philosophy, affect, post-humanism, new materialism, all these ideas that bodies extend virtually beyond their boundaries, um, focusing on the wearable sensor might seem like a regression at first, or maybe a loss of ground for fields such as dance among others. However, as Magnet puts it in When Biometrics Fail, human bodies are not biometrifiable. While industries built around such practices rest on the false assumption that human bodies can be rendered into biometric code, bodies are not stable, unchanging repositories of information, nor should biometric tech be understood as objective. Rather, such technologies reimagine the human body through algorithms, producing new meanings in the process. <clears throat> In this sense, it could be argued that looking closer at biodata and sharing somatic experience is not as regressive as it might seem. The contemporary wearable is never about the individual body, for better and for worse. Rather, it always represents how information from that individual body might be networked to travel and to make new meanings across bodies and environments. However, to think more specifically about the ways in which such tools enable circulation beyond the physical form, requires first seeing how they engage with the multiplicity of data formations already inherent in bodies. In this sense, we need to go even beyond the important critique of data collection and processing by Magnet and others in order to capture the ways in which biodata may stand partially in relation to multidimensional experience and how such partial, uncertain, and biased data may nonetheless operate <coughs> in multimodal forms to share experience with others. And so in thinking about what performance can add here, I'm particularly interested in Elisa Morrison's connection between the logic of theatrical naturalism and biometric science. So in the same way that naturalistic theater claimed to hold a looking glass up to nature, so too this, quote, seemingly disembodied and objective gaze of biometric surveillance privileges the biologically legible body over the individual's claims about him or herself. So Morrison is speaking about contemporary surveillance art and draws parallels to historical avant-garde theater's critiques of naturalism and its capacity to intervene in seemingly objective representations of the self. However, her point can be extended to uh, the potential of a broader set of performance and media works that engage with biodata. And so when I'm talking about this potential, what I'm thinking about is that on the one hand, their status as theatrical performance lends itself to stagings that emphasize the constructed, even spectacular nature of the knowledge for which that data stands. And on the other hand, the flawed and incomplete nature of biodata also offers opportunities to think more closely about the performances themselves, and particularly the ways they share experience by means of multiple feedback loops built on such partial data that may yet, or in fact better, give access to the multidimensional nature of that experience. So I want to turn now to Breath Catalog. So this is something that premiered in San Francisco in 2015. It's an ongoing project in collaboration with Megan Nicely and Ben Gimpert. So in this work, we aim to create a cabinet of breath curiosities in performance. So the model is drawn from historical cabinets of curiosities in which the natural coincided with the artificial and the desire for knowledge overlapped with experiments in organization and display. So as much as historical cabinets were about accumulation, they were also about marking the unknown. And here I'm interested in the slip from the curio to curiosity itself. So we did build a small cabinet installation in the theater entryways for audiences to engage with various dimensions of their breathing through simple sensory tasks. Um, however, in Breath Catalog, we primarily collect, share, and use experiences of and data on the performer's breathing. And we do this using experimental dance in conjunction with breath monitors and various representations of that data. So as sound, as projected visualizations, as breath objects. Um, so I'm going to flesh out the interwoven strands of embodiment, theatricality, technology, and medicine that figure into this project 
Um, but first, I'm just going to play a small clip from our highlight reel just so you have a few curios to hold on to. And maybe I say this now. Um, I feel like there's a lot of work today that is made to be filmed, to be photographed. This is a work that was made for audiences, and because of the way the audiences were configured with a long gangway and then audience on the side, it was always very difficult to film or photograph. Um, and so I, in some ways, the images I'm showing you, you'll have to deal with, and I appreciate that. at the core of breath catalog complicates the intrinsic connections between breath and movement. So in dance, breath is often used as a way to control an individual's physicality. So this, this ranges from more anatomical support, so say inhale on the extension, exhale on flexion, to more things like idiokinesis, where we imagine sending the volume of the breath into say the pelvic floor or the toes. Um, and as I've mentioned, breath is also a way to regulate the relationship between multiple bodies. So in contemporary dance, breath often coordinates the sense timing of a group of movers, right? But what happens when, instead of relying on breath to support solo movement patterns, we ask breath and body to move autonomously? So some of our simplest curios invo involve simple investigative tasks based on singular en events to di disentangle body and breath. So. Um, what happens if you breathe fast and move slow at the same time? Um, can you choreograph inhalations and exhalations the same way you choreograph movement? Can you move, breathe, and tell a story all at the same time while keeping all three on separate tracks? That one makes a great lecture performance. Um, so to go a bit farther down this somatic rabbit hole for a minute, the provisional separation allows us to access forms of breath that circulate independently of a single body. So instead of breath being the felt thing that connects two dancers, we are interested in how it might be visualized as an external third in the relationship and what this could catalyze. So in this sense, breath is understood to have the possibility of agency in breath catalog. So as much as breath is a quality that we move, it's also a force and can move us. So this threads through the project in three ways. So first, breath can function as an unpredictable breath object to create choreographic structures or games that challenge the nature of the relationship between the performers. Second, manipulating breath in this way changes the sensorial experience of the moving body. And third, magnifying and scaling the minutiae of such breath experiences can build a theatrical environment. So there's this cycle that involves the defamiliarization of breath, the reincorporation of that breath object into bodily experience, and then shifting that outside in breath back out again. So to make this visible to audiences raises concerns to do with theatricality. So whereas in a normal dance show, the breath would tend to be obscured behind lots of movement, right? Our project in Breath Catalog was to shift the hierarchy. So to keep uh, this, all of these properties of breath not only to perceptible to spectators, but in fact as a priority in how they watch a moving body that has all sorts of other things going on. As scholars who work on the relationships between medical imaging and art have pointed out, there's always the problem of, in Petra Kupper's words, 
how to weave together the phenomenological emphasis on experience and embodied action together with a trajectory toward deconstructivist unknowability. In other words, how do you move toward making the experience of the other visible without suggesting this other might be fully knowable? Right? In the case of Breath Catalog, we discovered that after we danced around for an hour with this intersubjective approach to our breath, everyone wanted to talk to us about their breath. Um, and so after one show, we had people leave us a note with something they experienced or discovered about breath, and we had over a 50% response rate, which if you've ever tried to get people to respond to anything, that's really unusual. Um, so, so there's something in this choreographic project that's about sharing breath, about finding new ways to make it not individual but communal, that reminds audiences that they're in <laughs> fact experts in their own breathing. And I realized during an artistic residency in the respiratory unit of Southmead Hospital that the kind of engagement that we experienced had everything to do with the very particular form of physical practice that we constructed. Um, so many of the exercises that we came to choreographically in terms of inserting space between breath and movement actually map onto pathological symptoms, but without stigma. Um, so uh, for example, the speaking and broken sentences that results from separating the breath and movement and speech tracks is actually something used by doctors as a symptom to identify pathological breathlessness. So when does the breathing interrupt a sentence is a very clear sign for them. So, so far I've spoken about some of the embodied practices of the project in the context of the dancer's own somatic experience of breath and circulation, as well as making that legible to audiences. So now I want to address how these interact with the use and reuse of data, um, of breath data and other recorded material. Um, and I'm going to talk through a few curios more specifically to do so. Um, and so when I say data, first we worked with prototypes of a consumer breath monitor um, that had a pressure sensor and a triaxis accelerometer. Later we moved to using capacitance resistance bands and we processed all of that using an interactive visualization software that we built. Um, so dance has often been a metaphor for technological possibilities. Um, but I'm interested here in how dance-based approaches in combination with tech might recompose the body. Right? So the tech has the potential to make breathing visible in a way that's otherwise impossible for the dancing body alone. But there's also a massive difference between our dancer experiences of breath and what a particular monitor can pick up and quantify. Right? Because the hardware picked up certain types and speeds of breath better than others, we had to find a movement language, curio by curio, that supported the technology's translation of that particular breath for audiences. By adapting the choreography to what the sensors demanded of the body, we also began to understand how these two forms of expertise feed into one another. So the first type of curio I want to talk about involves uh, the breathing body that's engaged with, mediated by the kinetic visual representations of breath. So in this curio, which you saw in the trailer, um, my dance partner and I had a task of keeping our breath synchronized as a way of synchronizing our bodies. Um, and the visualizations for the scene ran off Megan's sensor data in real time. So in addition to all of the more usual dancer senses, I could also check in with the projected representation of her breath. So there was always this three-way relationship. Um, other curio visits introduced a kind of visual latency that amplified the rhythm and duration of breath. So we could play games where once we stopped moving, we had to hold our breath until the viz completely settled before we're allowed to move again. Um, or you can build more complicated improvisational feedback loops. So here, um, Megan is wearing the sensor and is trailing my movement, but my movement is following a score that is based on the visualization of her breath doing my movement. Um, while both of these examples were about live feedback, we also collected and reused breath data. Um, so this curio, for example, was really about scaling breath. Uh, it's built with an additive visualization that collected and mixed our breath to build over time. Um, and so the movement here is very sparse and sculptural, but the accumulated breath through it is enough to build and change an immersive environment. And this came from an idea we first had of developing a pre-show with a really elaborate um, visual space that we, had to breathe, that we would have to breathe a certain amount through to clear it away before the show could ever start. So processes of saving and retrieving extended to other media, including audio recording. So this, what I'm about to play you, is part of the sound for the wall pant curio. 
um, which is based on the rhythmic exhale produced by slamming your back against a wall. Um, and what this has to do with is the way impact changes volume, if we talk about these different dimensions. So I've mentioned how easily our moving bodies could overwhelm the movement of breathing from both sensor and audience perspective. So here the thump of our bodies could be much uh, uh, louder than the exhalation it produced. Um, so our composer had us record and then perform to a modified recording of our breath from previously doing exactly the same choreography. Right? So in reactivating the relationship between past and present breath, we call attention to the breath task as a non-naturalistic modality that accesses specific dimensions of breathing. Um, we also worked with developing sensory experiences through the re-embodiment of found breath artifacts. Um, so here is a curio based on the opening of the late sci-fi noir film, Kiss Me Deadly. Um, and so what interested us when we started to watch film noirs was that there were these amazing scenes with intense breathing, uh, but when we shut off the sound, the performers' bodies didn't actually reflect that breathing. Um, so we developed what we call a kind of breath karaoke practice, which was all about returning uh, the, breathe, the physicality of the breath to these noir film scenes. So we've done theater versions and lecture performances, and we also uh, worked last year with a natural version of wind in a site-specific promenade performance on a farm in Northern California. And that was something where we started without the tech, and then as the sun went down, we started uh, dealing with more and more projections. Um, so right now, I'm interested in shifting the next face of the performance away from uh, projections to more of fabricating performance objects. Um, capable of visualizing the breath in 3D interactive form. Uh, so a modest example is this little toy, it's the breath jar, um, that we made for our 2016 UK performance. Um, and it's a palm-sized jam jar with some LEDs of flora and some feathers inside. It's pretty low-key. Um, but how it works in performance is I would stand in front of you and breathe, and you could see my breathing correlate to the shifting of shades of blue inside the jar. Um, and then I would hand the jar off to you to hold, and then you could pass it to someone else. Um, and although it's much simpler than some of the other breath objects we've explored, for example, we've done some really complicated things with fans, um, there's really something satisfying about that performative moment of entrusting uh, one's breath into someone else's care. Uh, so uh, another one I've been dreaming about but haven't built, I uh, have been dreaming about this one since the beginning eventually, um, it's a tiny puff of smoke that's emitted from the dancer's sternum each time she breathes, and so you could perform duets uh, with the traces that your breath leaves in the air. Um, and following on scaling there, we were also thinking about architecture, so something where, say, the breath of the dancer could control a giant bellows on stage. Um, or that breathes with her, or maybe it's the audience's breathing that animates an environment. So, as I said at the beginning, this talk draws together three strands of thought that are distinct but interrelated. So the multidimensional nature of breath and the ways in it which is both permeable but also challenging to share. The place of performance in dealing with the problems of biodata and experience and the set, specific set of artistic practices associated with creating a cabinet of breath curiosities in performance. Um, to conclude, I want to return to that dual meaning of palpability that threads through them. So when I speak about breath catalog, there's often a question about the dancers as expert breathers and the capacity for audience participation. So in the context of this talk, I find it particularly conspicuous that the phrase we used from the start in breath catalog was making the dancers breathing palpable to an audience. While this was not an audience participation show, we wanted the audience to engage with their own breath expertise, or at least curiosity, through our performance. And many described afterwards holding their breath with us at various moments, or suddenly discovering that they'd tuned into our patterns of inhalation and exhalation. In place of 
in terms of the place of breath data and all this, it does two things, both of which enable a tuning toward experience while also denaturalizing the process of knowing. So one, it's used to support disentangling the naturalness of conventional somatic relations between the individual body and breath. And two, it's tested as an interface between multiple bodies, calling to attention to the ways in which breath positions us in intangible and tangible relation to others. Across the sections of this talk, I'm interested in making a case for the place of multiple forms of expertise in the translation of multidimensional breath experience. One of the things that struck me in the hospital residency was how much time was spent in initial screenings speaking to patients and how very little involved any form of direct examination. Um, in, and this is in terms of just initial, uh, initial consultations for onward referrals, let me be very specific. Um, when I asked, one of the doctors told me that the part at the end where he got out their stethoscope and they took off their shirts um, was more for their benefit than for his. By that time, he'd already uh, made a diagnosis not only through their descriptions, and there's a really great study from 2008 about uh, the role of qualitative language in the diagnosis of COPD-related breathlessness, but also from what he observed in their bodies and breathing as they spoke to him. It was just that he knew most patients wouldn't trust a diagnosis if they didn't feel examined. So I'm interested in that. I'm interested in what methods we trust and don't trust to share sensory experience. In Phenomenology of Illness, Javi Carell writes about the unshareability of breathlessness and how it shuts the person experiencing it away from their loved ones. Likewise, most patients I observed lacked a robust language to describe their breath experiences, and in fact, many presented with increased difficulty when they turned their attention to describing their own symptoms. So there's something important about combining the possibility of collecting and sharing sensory experiences of breath with different modes of attention, ones that privilege the multidimensional play of breath itself. Thank you. So we have about five, six minutes for questions. Thank you very much for that. Hi, um, so during the whole lecture you've been talking about breath and bodies in a very active way in choreography and I want to know if you also research or are also interested in very passive ways, sort of like meditation where like body and breath are slowed down to the maximum possibility and how that inactivity interacts with breath. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't see those as so separate. Um, I, I, and so to me, I th one of the points that I'm trying to make is that this is why I start with the somatics. I think there's a very uh, mindful physical practice that's developed in and with the breath. And in fact, I mean, this is something interesting for this kind of work, if you're putting it on, if you're only presenting it, you get really dizzy. You can't, act, and so this was something really interesting in actually performing for others. It's harder to breathe under performance conditions, right? Um, but this was something that was really important for, was for us to be able to shift the modality to get ourselves into the mindset of each breath before each curio, because you can't just jump. They're totally separate breaths, totally different ways of approaching breath, totally different ways of approaching your body. Um, and so I think, I think I'm interested in some of the meditation practices that are related to breath. That isn't my area of expertise. But in many ways, exactly those connections of uh, breath and mind and body, I think, are entirely what's being explored in the choreographic pro practice. And this word you said, like, um, idiokinesis, this kind of imaginary of the body and passage of air and so on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do you also give agency to birth when you write a lecture? <sighs> 
<laughs> I'd like to think so sometimes more than others. I feel like, it's interesting, right? I feel like I have three modes. I have a lecture, I have a lecture demonstration, and I have a performance lecture. The performance lecture is where breath goes the farthest. The conventional lecture, I think, is where breath has the least space. But I found it really interesting that in some ways I had to start giving my breath more attention in prep to be able to do the fast slow for you. Because that takes a lot, that is a different breath mode. And so, so that I, it only works if I transition quickly, but I started about a paragraph ahead of time getting ready for you. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning of your lecture, I had to get used to the fact that I could um, notice your breathing in your talking. Hmm. So, yeah, the change for me in, yeah. During the lecture. Yeah, and I think that's really important. That's something that I'm really interested in developing. I mentored the lecture performance. That's something I've been playing back and forth with, especially talking about this material. Like, it's so different if I'm actually trying to deal with my breath while I'm talking to you, right? Totally different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure, maybe we have time for one quick question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe you already mentioned in your lecture, but with, I worked with a few choreographers who used a lot of breath support and, and worked yeah. a lot with breath. And in my experience, they, they worked a lot with repetition and, and strain. And the, the aim of breath for them was to, to sort of change your overall uh, physical awareness and also change your perception of the space and the air around you. Have you encountered any of these kinds of works in your research? Yeah. Um, I suppose there's two things. From my perspective, I have two sides. Um, for those of you who aren't in a contemporary dance world, there's a certain convention that happens a lot where the dancers are moving around and there's beautiful movement, mu movement and music soaring and then suddenly the music cuts out and you hear the effort of the dancers. I think that is something we're used to quite a lot, uh, an image. And I think very often um, in choreography, there is this interest in strain, in breath as evidence of the body's strain, and also, in the same way I talked about, breath provokes feeling. So also, getting into that particular more difficult breath as a way to provoke a more difficult feeling and challenge in the body. Um, I think there's two sides of that for me. On the one hand, I, I'm interested in pulling that back out in maybe the breath as something different. We do play with pushing breath, um, but I'm also very aware, right, there's, you know, we have people in the audience with COPD. We have, if people are breathing with us, where can I take an audience and an audience where I don't know what's going on with their breath, right? And so, so I feel like there's, that in some ways, in some ways we will push in that direction and I'm interested in people who are doing that but in other ways, I'm also interested in how the simple act of holding your breath for a period of time, of breathing only in choreography once people can recognize where that breathing is, that has a whole separate set of anxiety, even if it isn't this, right? So I'm interested in, again, I come out of that same world of breath as so intrinsic to the movement, and I think part of our interest and part of what we're playing with is what, what happens if it just gets pulled out a little bit more. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Can we do one more? Quickly, yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. It was really fascinating. Um, I just had a question about uh, the tech that you're using. Yeah. And um, you seem, I mean, it's very po using tech in a positive light, in a positive sense. And um, you spoke about uh, using consumer tech to kind of gather your data. And I was just wondering like how, um, what, what, what the limits of working with this consumer software is for you, and also how um, the data that this software has gathered is used by the, um, uh, by the, you know, the, the yeah. or the people who make the applications themselves, and if that's even a problem or a concern for you. And the other thing was is that like, um, I was in the Rijksmuseum the other day and I was watching like um, this uh, Joris Evans film about the Philips, Philips factory and uh, watching uh, all of these um, people blowing glass, actually. And I was just thinking about that's also kind of like a palpable form of breath. And so I was thinking it's about this light bulbs. 
Yeah, light bulbs, yeah. Oh, I've got to see this. Like, Don't it's really, it's, it's absolutely beautiful, yeah. but it's also like a kind of like about a thought relationship with technology. And yeah. I was just wondering if you had some thoughts about that. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. Let me, in honor of lunch, I'll be quick. Um, in terms of the consumer tech, so we started out initially using con uh, uh, prototypes from a startup that was really trying to do basically the Fitbit of breath, pretty much. And uh, when we first started working with them, we were really interested. Uh, and they basically gave us prototypes, gave us back end stuff, and let us go do our thing. Um, and later on, they realized breath was really hard to measure, and they did a bit of a pivot to, and they're not, no longer measuring breath, they're measuring calm. Uh, and if you're relying on that tech, that's uh, an interesting challenge. It, because in some ways they were, uh, you know, in terms of some of the relationship, they're trying to say, we do real-time Bluetooth, here are dancing bodies, they do real-time Bluetooth. You know, they, this, we can show you whether it's real-time or not, right? Um, in a lot, and then after that, we began working with uh, the capacitance bands are from a company that's much more uh, sports or high-end sports oriented, but more boutique and less uh, consumer framed. Uh, in terms of the data, it, it, we always put our data. You can go right now and download the data from data dump each night after the performances. We take all the data and we put it online. So we're. We're actually interested in what happens if breath is part of open data in that sense. Um, uh, in terms of the larger set of questions about consumer tech, I think this is where I'm going so much. Uh, bodies in general, particularly breath, is so hard to measure. And I think there's often a certain bravado, a promise that you'll measure it and you won't. And I think that's true um, both on the consumer tech and wearable market and also <laughs> in performance technology. Look, we did this. Our sensors worked. Well, actually, how do you deal with what they're measuring and what they're not measuring and how? And so for me, and this is where I'm getting at when I'm talking about working with partial fragmented data and so on. I'm interested in this sort of, there's this phrase I keep toying with, I don't know what I'm doing with it yet, totally. I mean, I do, but I don't. It's this idea of the curious choreography of the quantified self, right? That, that I think there is, if you take this idea of curiosity and if you run it up, I think the way that we're working with feedback loops and so on is uh, taking certain of these promises but reworking them with a set of questions rather than assuming that it's telling us things we know. Excellent. Yeah, and that was a great question. Thank you. Yeah. So let's uh, let's take a break for lunch, um, and we'll start at two o'clock with Anna Harris. Uh, before that, one thirty. If you want to breathe and move uh, here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>